Welcome to this live stream of Legends of Caledagia figure painting. I'm Jason, the creator of the Caledagia universe, as well as Legends of Caledagia, which is the game I'm kind of painting miniature from today, and of course Caledagia Fleet Commander, which is the um, game that you saw there in the little intro video if you're sticking around and watching that. So, and you can learn more about the Caledagia universe over at caledagia.com. You can find that thing, or that website, over here in this corner. You think by now I know I get this whole reverse screen thing down. Right there, caledagia.com. All right, so today I'm going to continue my work on the Oscoda Escort Carrier for the Colith Guard faction. I'm going to go ahead and work on the armor panels here on the top, applying the technique that I worked on last time. So I'm going to go over that a little bit more. But I thought also, as I'm doing this painting, why not talk about something? Of course, if you're here in the live chat room ever at twitch.tv, I'm watching my chat right over here on my laptop, um, feel free to ask any questions, not only about the process that I'm working on, but also I, if you have any interest in the tabletop game industry in general, or questions about creating a tabletop game or running a tabletop game company, I'll answer those as well. And if you're watching this on YouTube, um, I just head over to twitch.tv forward slash rocker robotics. And let me turn my microphone down a little bit. It's running a bit hot. That will work pretty good. Head over to twitch.tv forward slash rocker robotics. You can follow me there and get the notifications about when I go live because I don't have a set schedule yet because Christmas is coming up and that messes with things. Um, but probably 2017, maybe I'll put together a set schedule for this stuff because it's kind of fun. But anyway, I'll start painting this here in just a moment. But what I'm going to talk about today, I figured why not talk about 3D printing? Because it's one of those topics that everybody likes to talk about and most people really don't have a lot of experience with it. So they say lots of weird, crazy things. Um, I've actually got a lot of experience, fair, well, fair amount of experience with 3D printing because of this tabletop game industry thing and the whole figure manufacturing stuff. So I will certainly talk more about that from someone who's actually worked with the 3D printing quite a bit. So let's start here by jumping over to my work camera. And let's see, I didn't bump it. I bumped it, the camera as I was moving my chair around just a little bit ago. So there we go. Okay, that's pretty well fixed. Okay, so gonna get started here. The main armor color, I guess bring up the speed what I got up to this point here. So this is the Colith Guard Oscoda Escort Carrier. It was primed in red dragon primer from the Army Painter. That sounds right, Army Painter. It's red dragon skin, red primer, just to give it a pretty close base color to what it should be having. Its actual base color I normally use is the Citadel branded layer paint, Evil Sun Scarlet. This is, of course, Citadel is Games Workshop's brand of paints. So I'm gonna go and give that a little bit of armor panels, a little bit of that coating, because it is a little bit of a darker red than what the dragon skin primer is. So I think it looks a little bit better for this kind of a thing. Now, the first stuff I did last time, before, is in between all the armor panels, I ran several different types of Citadel branded shade. Um, in particular, here's the Nun Oil, Nun Oil. It's, it's some Empire thing. Um, and there's also a gloss version, which I did not use in between the cracks. I used this elsewhere, so I'll show you how that works. But for getting in between these little armor panels here, I used this shade. And now, once I've done that, I'm going to carefully paint over the armor panels with the Evil Sun Scarlet. Because, of course, when you run the shade, even though it collects in the recessed areas, you can see here a lot of the armor panels got messy stuff going on. All right. I got myself a new brush, nothing fancy. Just got a uh, 100, size 100 round brush from the local craft store, and that's what I'm gonna be using to paint up the armor panels. Now, one thing I've found is that when painting these armor panels, to hide your paint brush, or your paint, yeah, your paint brush strokes, it's best to go over them with several layers of thin red paint. Thick paint tends to really show the, um, the paint brush, the paint brush. <laughs> Thin paint really tends to show the paint brush strokes. And you know, obviously giant starships aren't supposed to be painted with paint brushes. So that kind of looks a little odd. Plus when you go to photograph them, that doesn't look very good either if you can see all the brush strokes. So by applying three or four layers of relatively thin coated paint, you actually can do a very nice job of hiding your brush strokes. 
Now the big issue you're going to run into with using thin paint, of course, is that the paint tends to run into the recesses where you have the shade already. So you just got to be very careful not to do that. If you do screw up a little bit, as I'm sure I'm going to do because I just always do, um, you can fix it. It just, it just, you got to be very careful then not to get the shade back on your armor panels. So I'm just going to go ahead and just move around the top of the warship here doing my best to put a layer of thin Evil Sun Scarlet Red paint on the top of these armor panels. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of talk a little bit about 3D printing, because why not? And if, you have any, if you're in the live chat room here and have any questions, feel free to ask away. Okay, so 3D printing, I'm sure you guys probably if you're watching this, you probably know what it is. It's been really popular in the past few years. But the basic gist is it allows it's a series of technologies, because it's not just one technology. There's a bunch of different ways you can really do it. And that's when you get into some of the details of patents and things like that. But it's a, it's a way of taking a 3D computer model and turning it into a real physical object. In fact, the Oscoda carrier I've got right in front of me here started its life off as a 3D model. In my case, I use Blender, which is a open source software, completely free. It does a pretty good job of 3D modeling. Actually, it does a pretty freaking awesome, awesome job of 3D modeling if you know how to use it right. And you can build a 3D model using that. And then to actually make the 3D print, I use a service called Shapeways. At shapeways.com and you upload a 3D model in a certain format, which Blender is fully capable of exporting and then they can go ahead and turn that 3D model into a very high quality 3D print. Now, the first thing I wanna talk a little bit about is why I used Shapeways. I'm sure they're not the only service out there offering this. I'm, I'm pretty confident I've came across others. But of course, you know, when you go to these tech news sites and things, they love to talk about all the home 3D printers. It's MakerBot and, you know, there's uh, DeWalt makes, is it DeWalt? No, Dremel. I think DeWalt might make one too. But I know Dremel makes one. I think HP is cranking them out. Pretty much everyone and their brother is, you know, making 3D printers these days, these days which isn't a bad thing. I mean, that's, that's a fantastic thing from a market perspective. Um... So the first thing to note about these 3D printers though, 3D printing is not a new technology. It was recently discovered by the tech press and that's why they're all thinking it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but it's actually been around for, oh man, it's gotta be at least 30-ish years. It's time-wise, it's kind of been a funny spot because it's old enough to where it's not new, but at the same time, it's not old enough to where patents are no longer valid. There's still plenty of active patents in it, and this is actually one of the reasons why I'm gonna rag on some of the, um, <laughs> not really rag on some of the, I'm not gonna sit here and rag on some of the um, home 3D printers, but it's gonna be explained as to why I'm going through Shapeways. Um, so the thing with the 3D printers, they're cool in the sense that they're cheap and they're accessible, relatively speaking. Um, 3D printing is still not easy. It's now possible for someone to actually do 3D printing at home. They're, it's not great though. The biggest thing about these 3D printers that you get at home, they all, most of them, not all of them, the Form Labs uses a different technique. And there's that weird $100 Kickstarter one that I knew somebody ordered it, so I'll take a look at that when that shows up. The, that weird Kickstarter one that you um, use your phone as a 3D printer, sure. We'll see what happens when I actually see that thing in reality. Um, but most of them use a type, I guess they call it's a type of extrusion, extrusion technique where you have a filament, which is just a long plastic wire that is melted down with heat and shot out through a nozzle very precisely. This type of manufacturing process really has some severe limits on exactly how good of a miniature you can really make. Uh, what you see in front of me here in this Oscoda, this is a resin cast from an actual high quality 3D printer from Shapeways. The, that type of technology described there 
is not something that you would actually, you are not be able to make a miniature like you see here. It simply cannot um, make something with a fine enough resolution. And in particular, it can't make it smooth enough. In fact, do I still have that little sample I got sitting over here? Let me get up from my computer here for one quick second. I think I actually have a sample from the MakerBot 2 that I picked up when I was at the Microsoft Store a few years ago. I will be right back in one quick second. So I'm fairly sure I can explain to you what I'm talking about with this process. You should sit over here. <laughs> um, still on everything. Aha, uh -huh, found it. I also need to get a um, paper towel. <laughs> I've got to get a paper towel for clean off my brush. All right. Hi, Ryan. How are you doing? Um, so, this is what I'm talking about right here. Let's see if I hold this guy up. This is a demo that the Microsoft Store has handed out, hence the Skype logo. If you look very carefully, I don't know how well you can see it on the video, but if you had this thing in your hand, if I hold, if I very carefully, there we go, as I watch the little fin down here, as I turn this thing back and forth, you're gonna see what looks to be a ton of tiny little lines. That is a result of the construction process that I was talking about for 3D printing. It creates a surface that is not smooth and frankly is crap if you wanted to actually make high quality game miniatures. So that's why a lot of the current um, desktop 3D printers that you can buy, they really are not capable of producing the quality of miniatures for that you know a company would want to sell they certainly can't compete with in terms of quality with the top level manufacturers out there games workshop private tier press etc etc you're never going to get anything near that quality if people say they can other home printers they're just full of crap and they are um <laughs> they're basically a bit fanboys because they probably spent two thousand dollars on a 3d printer and trying to justify their investment i'm not going to lie um now the reason why a lot of home printers do that because is be, it comes down to the issue of patents. As I mentioned, 3D printing is kind of old. It's taking, a, oh, it's taking a break from Netflix. What are you watching Netflix, Ryan, out of curiosity? Um, <laughs> I'm carrying on two conversations here. So 3D, as I mentioned, 3D printing is an old technology, but the fact that it's not old enough to where patents are, ex most patents aren't expired yet. So a lot of these companies that are building these home 3D printers are using that type of printing technology because they have to use that type of 3D printing technology. Form Labs, they make the Form 2 3D printer, which does not use that extrusion technology. It's some sort of, they have a resin that is cured with a light or laser or something like that. And that company actually got, Ooh, I want to say they they had I won't, I won't say it. they had some legal issues. That's a good way to put it. Legal issues with Stratus. Stratus is like the big boy in the 3D printing industry. The company that no one ever talks about in the tech industry because they are they they're one of the industry leaders in making amazingly high quality, super awesome 3D printers that are used in industries that actually know how to use 3D printing. Um, in particular, game tabletop game manufacturing. But, so that's what they run in. So pretty much right now, by default, a lot of these home 3D printers are stuck in a certain level of technology. So right off the bat, just because of that, they, they simply can't compete with the high quality type of printers that Shapeways uses. I don't know exactly what types of printers Shapeways uses. I'd imagine Stratus, Stratus, I think I'm pronouncing it right, Stratus. Um, Stratasys or something like that. I, could, I imagine they probably got a number of those printers in-house. There is one other big company that does also manufacture a lot of industrial, very high quality 3D printers as well. Um, but those kind of things, you're talking $10,000 to $100,000 for high quality 3D printers, if not more. Currently it's the crown and once upon a time. Oh, okay. That's my friend, that's my friend Ryan from Tales of Valhalla. He's just jumped in the chat room and is talking about the shows he's watched on Netflix right now. So 
So that was a very long-winded expl explanation of why I still use Shapeway, simply because the technology for high-quality 3D printing miniatures is not affordable for the average person yet. It's something that's been around... Now, 3D printing has been around in the tabletop game industry for quite a long time. If the website still existed, the old WizKids website, the guys who made Mech Warrior, Dark Age, Age of Destruction, etc., etc., actually had a really cool behind-the-scenes look back in the day for their Falcon's Prey expansion, where they're showing off some of the new Jade Falcon models and how they were using 3D printing to create the masters uh, for the miniatures at that time. I believe Games Workshop does a heck of a ton of 3D printing for their initial masters. Uh, not every company does. The Arena Rex guys, I think they still use, there's a Guild Ball. Either Arena Rex or Guild Ball, one of those two is still hardcore into doing traditional sculpting. I forget which one it is. Someone, I think it's one of those two companies. So 3D printing is not completely taken over the industry. There's still organizations and companies that still use traditional sculpting process of green stuff and things along those lines. But 3D printing will eventually become the main the main manufacturing process, at least in the short term for doing the um, greens. Now, greens is one of those company terminology for referring to the original master miniature that you make your molds from. Um, so the reason why 3D printing, the other, now the next topic of 3D printing is why has it not actually replaced traditional mini, mini, miniature manufacturing? And there's two reasons for that. One, it's still really expensive. Relatively speaking, the traditional mini, miniature manufacturing, you got your three different types, right? You got pewter or lead, which apparently companies still actually make lead miniatures. I recently purchased um, Blue Moon Historical Miniatures. Yes, I'm finally getting into historical gaming. They make 15 millimeter American Revolution, as well as I purchased a small number of 15 millimeter uh, American Civil War Union soldiers. And they still use lead-based pewter. Whereas most game companies that make pewter now, they use pewter, they, don't, they use lead-free pewter, which is primarily based around tin. Now I'm getting really far off topic, aren't I? That's right. I got about an hour of random content to fill. Oh, I should be recording this. Oops, I forgot to hit the start recording button. Well, I'll have to download off YouTube. <laughs> God, once upon a time it was predictable but addicting, eh? I don't even know what the crown is. What's the crown about? Back talking to Ryan there. So, anyway, when it comes to pewter miniature manufacturing, the reason why a lot of smaller companies like mine still use it is it's dirt simple to do, there's almost no startup cost, and it's very, very easy. You can buy the materials for making the molds for about $30. Uh, Smooth On is the company that manufactures, they make resin, primarily resin tools, but they have a line of silicone rubber that can ha that can withstand 600-ish, six, about 600 degrees Fahrenheit, a little bit less, I think it's 576, but almost 600 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a plenty hot enough for lead, for melting lead-free pewter. And you can actually melt lead-free pewter using a camping stove. That's what, how I manufacture some of the newest miniatures, the um, the new Suricari, Delphinus, and Draco kits, as well as the Aragul Hammerhead uh, mackerel kits. Let me just toss this up there because I can. So that guy there is the Delphinus, and then there's our hammerhead. Now, those I actually manufactured using a $30 camping stove that I bought from what's that? Bass Pro Shops. Uh, Bass Pro Shops is just a simple protein, pro, protein, propane camping stove that you can you can crank out a ton of heat, easily reach a, little, a small little cast iron pot up to 600 degrees, melt the pewter, you pour it in, and once you get a rhythm down of about three molds, you can basically pour, pour the three molds, and then by the time you're ready to pour pour the other, the original one, it's cool, you can pop it out, toss in some water, and it cools off. Now there are some limitations to that type of mold making, in particular with gravity fed pewter molds, there's a limit to actually how small you can get. Um, 
This Oscoda here actually are gravity fed pewter molds that I manufactured myself and let's see if you can, I don't know if you can see how well you can see the size of the gun barrels here. But that's about as small as you can get using gravity fed pewter. Otherwise, you have to use spin casting, which is a way of using something spinning really, 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 really fast to basically force the pewter into very small molds. That's things like how my 15 millimeter historical minis are being manufactured because they have tiny little rifles and little details, and how the vast majority of the tabletop game industry is manufactured, but they use the spin casting method. Of course. Then you've got resin. Now resin um, is also very cheap. The, it costs about the same amount to make a resin mold as it does a pewter mold. But, and the advantage to resin is that material wise it is cheaper. So per, per ounce resin is cheaper than pewter. And is that correct? Yes. per. Per ounce resin is cheaper than pewter. However, pu resin casting is a more manually intensive process. Because when it comes to that spin casting method I was talking about, you can crank out pewter things really fast. You just put the mold in, hit a button, and go. Um, resin casting, because resin is a type of material, it's a plastic material that has two parts to it, you know, part A, part B, and when you mix them together in a proper ratio, depending on what type of uh, resin you're working with, it's gonna begin a curing process. The crown is about, okay. I'm sorry, I was reading Ryan's comment about the crown. That's not, that's not a documentary, is, it? is that a, is that a, uh, the crown, is that a um, documentary, or is that like a, uh, I guess a historical fiction show or whatever. Because there's one show about the British monarchy of this guy who the narrator constantly walks towards the camera. It's like, it's just this, the way he does the, his filming. He starts, he starts back and as he talks for his narration, he gets closer and closer and closer to the camera. And it's just hilarious because at one point, <laughs> This is me rambling again. At one point, he has such a long narration part that he walks half up to the camera, stops, takes a break, leans against the wall for a minute, and then resumes walking to the camera to finish his slide. I don't know what that, that series was called though, because it's basically a documentary series on the history of the kings of England. It's absolutely hilarious. It's a fantastic show. It's just the way that the guy does his narration is just, just classic. And he seems like he's angry all the time too. Um, I want to say it was like called Monarchy or something like that. I think, I'm pretty sure it's a BBC show. But anyway, the I issue with resin is you can't spin cast it. At least you don't, well, you might be able to spin cast it. It's not something that's normally done. There's been, I have had some thoughts that maybe Games Workshop with their Citadel Fine cast, which frankly no one really liked and I didn't really like it either, may have been spin cast because the fact that it was, I believe they actually used the pewter molds, the molds that were designed for pewter. Because you can use, mold rubber designed for pewter with most types of resin. It's, it should work. It just doesn't make any sense to do so because there's other types of, of silicone rubber that work better with resin for one reason or another. Um, so in general, you're kind of left with resin casting doing one, you know, one cast at a time. Of course, you can have multiple molds going, but if you really want to get it right, you, ha you use some sort of vacuum pressure casting. Uh, vacuum pressure casting, is it pressure casting? What are you gonna call it? You put, not vacuum pressure, it'd be pressure casting. Vac you, you can vacuum the mold to reduce air bubbles, but you basically put the mold with the, the resin in it, so while the resin's curing, you put it in a chamber which increases the pressure of the atmosphere, which helps significantly reduce the issues with air bubbles. Because frankly, when it comes to resin casting, tiny air bubbles are your enemy. But that's a whole other topic altogether. So resin casting can be is another cheap way of making plastic molds, but it's very plastic miniatures, but it's very slow. The real awesome way to make miniatures is to use injection plastic molding. This is how any of the major companies, a lot of the major companies do it. A lot of smaller companies use resin casting. But it's a it's a process where you can just crank out miniatures dirt cheap. Um, Games Workshop's plastics are all plastic injection molding. 
I don't know what Privateer Press uses. They've kind of changed their techniques over the years, I believe. Um, but anything where you get a piece of plastic that's on a sprue, that's plastic injection molding. And that's where liquid plastic is just jammed into a mold and it's forced into all the crevices. And it's a very, like I said, it's a very fast way to make miniatures. The downside to it is that it's very expensive to make the molds. Um, usually the number that gets tossed around is about $10,000-ish for a one foot by one foot plastic injection molding. But of course, those are prices that are a few years ago and I honestly haven't looked into it since then because, well, I'm not gonna pay $10,000 at this point to go down that process. Plus, a lot of that kind of manufacturing is done outside the United States, which adds just a whole nother level of complexity for a small company to deal with. So enter 3D printing. <laughs> oh, but I should say with plastic injection molding, once you get the process started, you're talking pennies to make some of these miniatures. Um, so most of the most of the profit of the miniatures goes to pretty much covering that initial um, investment to getting the th getting the mold made. So enter 3D printing as an actual manufacturing process. Right now, it's still very expensive to manufacture um, 3D printed miniatures. This guy right here, the Ascoda Escort Carrier, if you want to get him in high, in high resolution 3D print, you're looking somewhere in the neighborhood of $50. This is through Shapeways. Of course, Shapeways has gonna have a markup involved on it because that's what, the, you know, that's what they sell. But if I were to manufacture it myself, um, it wouldn't probably be a lot cheaper. And of course, there's a very expensive five to six figure initial investment in getting a 3D print. 3D printer that can make such a high quality thing. Then you're gonna run into the problem of, well, you've got the printer, now you've gotta buy the plastic. And this is really the big unknown when it comes to the cost of 3D printing. Because a lot of people are saying that, you know, 3D printing is gonna doom the tabletop game miniatures industry. A couple years ago at Penguin that is a local science fiction geek, just bizarro convention at this point anymore. There's just lots of weird stuff there. Cool place to go to. I'll probably be going there again this year. It's in Southfield, Michigan. Um, but if you ever go there and see the kind of stuff some people talk about, you'll know why I say it's a bizarro convention. That's going to get me in trouble someday for saying that. But, oh well. <laughs> I should not be doing live streaming on the internet. Um... So what was I talking about there? <laughs> I get randomly off topic. Oh yeah, so 3D printing. The big unknown still is the cost of the materials. Because the problem you're gonna run into is that most of these printers are going to be using proprietary methods of refilling them. Uh, you're gonna have some sort of proprietary cartridge, certain types of plastic. It's mainly gonna probably be a cartridge thing. They all kind of use very similar chemistry or can use very similar chemistries of plastics, but they all are gonna have, probably have their own proprietary cartridge. However, that is is gonna vary from printer to printer because you know what? That's how these companies are gonna make their money. Um, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, because I was talking of, <laughs> man, I'm really jumping around here. Because that's how they're gonna make their money because the question of course is the 3D printing is gonna destroy the tabletop game industry because tabletop game companies make most of their money off the miniatures. You know, I did the math for that presentation where I had a 2000 point, was it 2000, or 2250 point Warhammer Fantasy Army back when that game existed. And you, at the retail prices of the time, to get everything you needed to play that 2250 point army, it was something like 600 to $700 Retail, modern retail. Fortunately, I bought it a lot cheaper, and you can sometimes save money in Games Workshop stuff. Sometimes, or you just go eBay. Um, but of that six to seven hundred dollars, about eighty percent of it was miniatures. The other twenty percent being the main rule book and the army book. So, the vast majority of revenue from any tabletop game company is going to come from miniatures, just because. They're the kind of thing that you know you're going to buy the most of. So if 3D printing were to ever be economical at your house and take off, it would be a serious threat 
to the tabletop game industry as we know it right now. The question is, is that going to happen? And that comes back to the whole proprietary cartridge thing I started talking about. Because the big unknown is how much is it going to cost for um, you know these 3D printers to refill their plastic printing cartridges. Of course, right now we all have some type of printer for normal printing. Um, and most people have little home printers. I don't. I've got a nice office jet printer. Or office, what do I have? Epson Workforce. Epson Workforce printer. But with a, you know, you've, you, I'm sure everybody knows right now is that with if they have one of those basic home printers, ink is ridiculously, stupidly expensive. You know, there's those numbers that say it costs, it's more than the weight of, or, you know, it costs more than equal weight of gold, equal volume gold, whatever it is. I don't know if that number is exact, is accurate or not, but everyone knows that ink cartridge is very expensive because that's where most of these companies, uh, well, not most companies, that's where these companies make their money in home printers. In the office market, of course, is very different because you got to compete with um, laser printing, and there's obviously a, a market incentive because of the sheer volume of printing to drive down the price of printing. But that doesn't exist in the home market. That's why home printers are often, you know, cheap or free with after rebates, so that we can spend a hundred dollars on ink when you want to print something off. I gotta let this paint dry for just one quick moment. So why don't I jump back to my main camera? So, you can kind of imagine that situation could possibly occur with 3D printing. Because right now, as much as people like to complain about how much various rule books for games and things cost, it's still cheaper to buy them from a company than it is to print them yourself. I mean, I've seen people who, they, they really want to stick it to the you know game manufacturers. So they go and get some pirated uh, PDF, download it offline, and they print out themselves, and they end up paying more in ink cartridges than it would cost them to buy the book from the manufacturer and because they print it off in their home inkjet printer the quality of the printing is a lot crappier than if they were just to buy it from the manufacturer in the first place. So the question of course then comes in with 3D printing is the same thing going to happen with 3D printing and the answer is we don't really know it could. It very easily could be a situation to where the home 3D printing market shapes up in such a way that um, that it just simply is not economical for people to print miniatures at home. So that's the that's one of the big things where you know people say that it's going to kill the 3D industry, 3D or 3D printing going to kill the tabletop game industry. There's a lot of things we just don't really know that could happen. And the other thing you got to realize with 3D printing is it's not easy to do. Um, When you get a, when you start talking about getting into 3D printing, it's not quite as simple as simply here's your download your 3D model off the internet and print out in your home 3D printer. You need what's called structure. Or there's like structure printing to it, because there's a certain way you want to print um, you know miniatures out. Otherwise, usually it's physically impossible to print something where nothing exists. Um, it's kind of a strange thing to explain. If you ever read about 3D printing, you, you can kind of read more into it. But you know, you think about, for example, if I hold up this Oscoda here, you can actually kind of see what I'm talking about. So you have that nose pointing, that kind of points up a little bit. And if, if you're 3D printing it, the, you know, the question is, how do you print that very bottom layer there? Because obviously that very bottom layer rises off the ground. So there is got to be some sort of structure, a substrate, or something where this miniature is printed in, to that can support the, the miniature, be, you know that area of the miniature before it's actually printed. Um, and, and oftentimes that requires you to design your own structure for printing it, or it relies on some software to generate that for you. But either way, you're going to run. It's not easy to start 3D printing. You're going to run into problems. You have to figure out how to solve, and that kind of knowledge requires you to understand. 3D modeling software, which if you have, go for it. It's awesome. 3D printing is awesome. But it's not on that level to where someone who doesn't have that kind of experience can really figure out what's going on. Okay, next step here. So I just put some more of the Evil Sun Scarlet down, and I'm mixing in a little bit of Linen White Reaper Miniatures Master Series. So I'm going to give it a little bit of a pink highlight on the edge of, the, of these armor panels. I actually really want my dry brush brush for this, don't I? Where's my dry brush brush? 
I'm gonna get up for one quick second. I gotta go grab my dry brush brush, which is sitting over behind the blue screen. So I'll be back in one moment to keep talking about 3D printing. If you have any questions about what I'm doing or about the tabletop game industry, feel free to ask in the chat room and I can answer those questions for you. Dry brush brush, where did I put that? Here it is. That'll work. So long story short, again, back to the whole 3D printing, there's still just a lot of unknowns that we don't know about how the market's gonna shape up. It's still gonna be a number of years till the good technology even becomes practical for the home printer market. When it does, we'll see what things start to happen, but until then, you're still looking at things like Shapeways and companies that have access to really expensive 3D printing that's gonna really be driving the market forward. Now, of course, there's always, uh, what can happen is that local game stores or office supply stores can get in the, the local 3D printing market. Um, there was a local store around here a couple years ago that was talking about buying a nice high quality 3D printer. I want to say who was, who runs the, who runs the local, who was the store that was at, I was at ProerCon a few weeks ago, it's a historical convention. I-94 Enterprises, they sell and went over their booth. They sold. They sell a whole bunch of historical aircraft miniatures. He he owns. He said he owns a very very expensive three D printer, like a fifty thousand dollars three D printer. He makes miniatures that he then you know cast in various materials and sells. So you're going to start seeing some of these companies and local businesses that can afford these expensive three D printers and start selling three D printing as a service. And this is where things get interesting, because at this point is where intellectual property really starts to come into play. Because of course, we've, if you've been around the internet for a while, you've probably followed the stories of, of the movie industry, trying to go after people for sharing their movies and music and things, television shows, et cetera, et cetera, on BitTorrent and other types of peer-to-peer -peer sharing um, networks. Of course, with 3D printing, as you talk about 3D models, that can kind of start to happen. And even if home printing doesn't really become very commonplace because, you know, the things I mentioned where the cost of the plastic is too prohibitive, patents never really trickle down to the home printing market, things like that, and the really good technology isn't there, you're going to start getting things like office supply stores and game stores who can now print these 3D models out for you. And that's, you can start getting into areas as to where it becomes a bit of a gray um, market in terms of copyright status. I know, I think in Europe, was it Europe? The Staples, who they were very, was it Europe? Maybe it's Canada, I don't know. Some, somewhere outside of the United States, Staples, which is a, here in the United States, is a very large office supply chain, was gonna start doing 3D printing. Now, of course, Staples is not gonna be printing your Warhammer, your bootleg Warhammer miniatures off for you because they are probably gonna respect you know, intellectual property rights, even though, honestly, they may not know what an, you know, an Eldar striking scorpion is, they can probably figure out, they're gonna, if they know that you're trying to bootleg you know, Warhammer miniature, they're not gonna print it off for you. But that, you know, that guy down the street who runs a game store that might be kind of shady, because there's some shady people who run game stores, there's shady people who run lots of businesses. Um, he may have no problem, you know, printing off bootleg Warhammer miniatures for you. Granted, it may go, but, you know, if he doesn't sell Warhammer stuff, he'd, he might may be able to make more money selling bootleg Warhammer miniatures discreetly under the table than trying to sell actual, you know, Warhammer miniatures following the Warhammer uh, Games Workshop's fairly strict uh, retailer guidelines. So I think that's, if there's gonna be an inter anything interesting happening in the kind of home small 3D printing market, that's where it's gonna start first. So I don't know when that's gonna happen. You know, like I said, for mo probably most game stores, uh, you know, a 50,000, 50 to $100,000 game printer is still way out of what, you know, is really out of the question at the moment. Uh, most of them struggle to survive, let alone, you know, have that kind of capital to throw away at, at you know, once to 
get a new piece of equipment for you know something for a marker that may not exist you know locally for them but I think that's where you're gonna see some of the really kind of interesting 3d printing things happening first before you start seeing any kind of home 3d printing revolution because also when you got some guy at a store who has his own high quality 3d printer you're gonna assume that he knows how to properly work with the 3D models to make them actually work. Because, you know, 3D printing, you, you can just because you take a model offline doesn't mean the person actually printed it and doesn't mean that the person actually tested it on your particular brand of 3D printers. So right now, in terms of painting, I am taking some more of this mixture of the Evil Sun Scarlet and the Linen White that I'm using, and I'm highlighting the edges that I just dry brushed give it even more distinct pink edge there. So that's my one little painting step here as I go back to rambling about 3D printing. But I think I'm just about done with the topic of 3D printing because I've kind of really went over a whole heck of a lot here. The moral of the story being, I don't really know what's going to happen. but. I don't think that it's going to destroy the tabletop gaming industry anytime soon. Um, the steps that need to happen still aren't there yet. The companies that are that do own patents that really have that own patents for making machines that are, can produce really high quality miniatures are actively defending those patents legally in court, and there have been some pretty high profile court cases. Um, you've seen who bought. Somebody bought MakerBot. I, did they? Okay, now I'm not. Now I might be running off in a crazy speculation land. I should look that up. But you're going to start seeing some of these smaller companies who are leading the market are going to get snatched up by bigger companies who want to enter the market, and that's going to that's obviously going to be a major dynamic that changes there. The one thing, you, another kind of wild card thing, you don't, you really can't be sure what's going to happen is what are the big bigger tabletop game companies going to do. Of course, you know, I mentioned a few minutes ago about how there's been this huge war over the past decade for, you know, uh, the intellectual property war with uh, movies and, and music and television shows and things like that in terms of file sharing. I don't know if companies like Games Workshop really have the capital to be trying to fight... Um, to be fighting a lot of little battles for protecting the intellectual property on that level, or if it even makes sense for them to do it from a, you know, uh, kind of consumer, customer friendliness, what's that word I want to think? Like from a, kind of a, what's that, why can't I think of that phrase? You know, like basically, it, it could look, it could end up really looking very bad for them doing that. Now, of course, they have protected their intellectual property rights. There's some, well-known cases of that, I mean, most famously being um, Chapter House Studios and that whole debacle, and you can go read about Games Workshop versus Chapter House Studios and get an idea of how that went down. So the Games Workshop does protect their intellectual property rights. There was that German fan film that got shut down, which, by the way, is on YouTube, um, if you go look for it. <laughs> oh, I probably shouldn't say that. I'm too late. No, but, you know... It, it's been leaked on the internet for a long time. You know, if you know how to, you can probably find it somewhere if you really want to look for it. It's actually not a half bad little film. I mean, it's zero budget, so you're going to get what you get for zero budget, but it was just kind of, it's kind of cool to see an actual game, you know, like see Warhammer, a Warhammer movie. I never did watch Ultramarines. It's funny, if you go read the reviews of the Ultramarines movie, which is that CG one that Games Workshop, some, I don't know who made it, but you know, Games Workshop licensed it too. It's either like sheer anger and hatred, or it's like, this is awesome, I can't wait, I finally get to see Warhammer, you know, as a movie. And it's like, okay, so I don't know what the deal with that was. I never actually saw it. Um, anyway, I've kind of gone on enough about 3D printing. I don't know if there's a whole lot more. Oh, there's one more thing I can talk about. Why don't I talk about how I, my company, uses 3D printing? Huh, what a concept. Because I actually sell 3D prints. Now, I mentioned here a little bit ago, this Oscoda I'm painting up. Of course, this would be like $50 if I were to get it 3D printed through Shapeways. So obviously, this 
this ship here is not a 3D print, it's a resin cast of a 3D print, but as I mentioned, I really have severe limits on some of the small sizes of the guns and things that I can manufacture with whether resin casting. Well, small guns is for resin, thin resin parts. It's just a bad idea in general. Uh, resin snaps. So I've seen like I've, I've seen like some Forge World models that have tiny, have very thin resin parts, and I just think it's a terrible idea because um, they do break very, very easily. I mean, you know, Forge World looks awesome, but I really can't rec ever recommend um, resin for things like little gun barrels, staves, swords, spears, things like that. Just resin is just a disaster. Um, in fact, like the Rena Rex miniatures I got a little bit ago, they're resin except for some of their weapon shafts, they're pewter. Uh, but, so to solve that problem, what I've done is I'm actually selling 3D prints along with the pewter and resin cast. Let me bring up my Delphinus here again. He's an example. The Delphinus, this gun turret up here, his main gun turret at top, that is a 3D print. He's also got a pair of guns underneath his hull. You can't see them in the image. Those are 3D prints. And the little fighters escorting him, which you can purchase at Kaladashi.com, that's a Sur those are Surikar interceptors, those are 3D prints. And the reason I chose to do that is because it's simply too, like I mentioned before, it's too cost prohibitive for me to go down the route of producing, you know, the very expensive mold for making plastic ejection molding and going from there. So for these small number of miniatures that I make and sell for these kind of things, it's actually quite economical for me to make these tiny parts in 3D printing and sell them. Because the fact that I'm selling directly to the customer and not going through a distributor and, and a um, retailer, the extra cost of making the 3D print, well, you know, I just, I just end up making a little bit less money in terms of profit per miniature, but it lets me get a lot cooler looking miniatures than I would be able to do with say pewter or resin with the available technology to have to me. All right. The last thing I want to do with this the armor panels now is I want to make them look a little bit grungy from one side this is where you got to be very careful too much you ruin everything you just did all right so here's this uh nun oil non oil I should ask my friend who plays this army how you pronounce it I, I meant I was gonna do that last Saturday but he didn't show up to game night so next time he's there I will ask him so I'm, I'm fairly certain that is an a Warhammer army of the Empire if I recall correctly all right, okay, but anyway, this is a, a Citadel Shade. A uh, Citadel Shade is what Games Workshop calls their washes. And there's very thin down paints. And being very careful, you want to put this shade opposite the side that you highlighted in pink. Too much, and you're going to ruin things just amount, just the right amount, and you can get a really cool effect that, frankly, you probably can't even see on this on this camera. But just trust me, it can be really cool. Um, that Delphinus I keep popping up here has it, has it, and by using the um, gloss version, because there's a gloss version and a non-gloss version, Delphinus can pop back up. I did the same thing here in the Delphinus and its armor panels on the inside. Like I said, you can't really see it very well in the photo, but if you saw the miniature in person, it looks pretty darn cool. It's just a way of getting a bit more of a gradient in terms of from bright to dark and, and bright to grimy. And it may take a few passes and just being very careful with it. Not to put too much on there, but it's the gloss type, because like I said, there's a gloss uh, shade and a non-gloss shade. The gloss shade still makes it look a little bit shiny, like it's worn down metal. And it looks really cool when you do it right. Granted, like I said, doing it right is kind of tricky, but it looks cool when you do it right. Oh boy, I think I've gone through more than enough about 3D printing. I'll have something cool, probably just talk a little bit more about the game manufacturing process sometime in the future. If maybe resin casting some more, I can talk a lot about that. 
it's actually pretty easy to do, but there's a lot of neat little tricks I found over the years that that lets you can kind of get around the fact if you don't have a um, you know a pressure chamber because frankly pressure chambers are like really expensive. Now some people build their own. I don't like the idea of do it yourself when it involves high air pressure because high air pressure plus do it yourself can result in fragmentation grenade and fragmentation grenades even if they're accidentally built because of exploit air pressure can still kill you so if I want to get a pressure tank I want to get one that's built specifically to handle the pressure you would use for resin casting um, and not try to build my own and risk blowing myself up well, you know, fragmentation myself to death, as well as several other people in neighboring apartments. That would just be a very bad thing to have happen. Because you can you can find tutorials in, on the internet about people who built those kind of things out of uh, what's the thing? Some type of uh, some type of painting, some type of painting tool. I'm trying to think what it is. It's um, so it might be some sort of pressure mixer or something. There's something you can you use. With house with giant gallons of house paint that produces a little bit of pressure, it might be just to be a pressure painting tank or something like that. But they really aren't designed to handle safely the levels of pressure you want to use for resin casting. So you're kind of pushing them to their safety limits, which is why I'd rather not try to do that. You know, spending the difference between spending a hundred dollars and eight hundred dollars when the difference is like not killing yourself, it's worth spending the other seven extra seven hundred bucks. But more about that later on in the future. All right, so we're getting a little bit of grungy look to the ship. That's what I was trying to go for. Um, it's kind of like what I'm. That's kind of like what I'm wanting to get at. It's looking kind of cool here. I think I went, went a little bit, a little bit too overboard with some of the nun oil in some of these parts. But that's all right. Just makes the ship a little bit more grungy looking. Now last time in the first part of this series where I just kind of randomly talked about some of the Koi Guard factions and how I named some of the ships and things like that, which you can find on YouTube, probably I'll, I'll probably start a little playlist of this entire thing because I talk about just random stuff each time. Um, this was an Arbor of Justice ship, which is one of the sub-factions that you learn about in the uh, at the end of the Barnside Car campaign over at Kaladazia.com. And I should mark it as such. And why don't I go and give those markings to, or start giving those markings to it right now? And how you do that is I'm going to take the linen white from the Reaper Master series, put some of that down, and you paint some of the armor panels as linen white. And this becomes their squadron markings for the Arbiters of Justice. So it's really just kind of choosing what you want and ideally you would paint your entire fleet the same way, the same approximate locations on the ships. Oh, and this is white. White is a pain to use. White is one of the hardest paint, in my opinion, to paint with. You really have to thin it down and do that multiple thin layers because white is fantastic at showing uh, brush strokes. Some people say white's easy to paint with. I think it's ridiculously hard. So that's why I'm using a really thin down paint just like I did initially with the Evil Sun Scarlet. And I'm gonna go ahead and put you know, like three or four layers of paint on each of these sections where I, that I'm painting um, white. It looks like I did slop a little bit, so I'll have to clean that up just a tiny bit. I got a little bit of paint in here in between um, two of the armor panels, but I will go back and very carefully clean that up later. But this particular type of marketing, marketing, and this particular type of marking is what the Arbiters of Justice do just so they can visually identify their ships. Granted, you know, they can do other methods of identification that are not visual re required, such as broadcasting certain frequencies, blah, blah, blah. But this is just a way of making their ships look different for anything, at the very least, for purposes of just tabletop gaming, because, you know, 
even in science, even though it's science fiction, and they would be kind of using some sort of other way to identify the ships being friend or foe than simply just, you know, markings in the hull. It looks cool, and that's in the end the reason why you do that because something looks cool for, because it looks cool on the tabletop, and that's really what matters in the end, right? <laughs> I'm gonna do one more set of this. Let's do right here in the middle. Um, let's do this this piece right here that runs pretty much across the entire side of the hall. And then once the um, previous layers of the paint start to dry a little bit, you can go back with some more thin layers and paint them. Yellow is a real paint. Pain the paint. <laughs> yes, yes. I've heard that yellow is a terrible, terrible color to paint. Uh, pale magenta. Hello, pale magenta. Yeah, I, I've actually never used yellow. Um, I think I may have tried to paint something yellow once, and I had such a heck of a time, especially over like a black primer. Whew! I just I've managed to avoid that color literally forever right my, all my miniatures and basically all my armies are almost all like forest camo colors greens and browns and i do have a little bit of orange which orange is pretty bad to paint over too especially the the older games workshop orange was pretty nasty to paint i haven't tried any of the, the newer oranges they have i haven't had, i've still running the old stuff i still have a pot of the old stuff that works great but yeah, I've heard I've heard horror stories about yellow. <laughs> Is there any certain brand of paint that works well for yellow? You know, works whose yellow is better than others? Yellow, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. They say, uh, Pale Magenta here in the chat room was saying that, you know, if you want to paint yellow, you should start with a white base of some sort instead of black, which makes sense. Um, So I'm just going to finish up these few white sections here. I think I'm going to probably call it a day. I've been streaming for quite a while now. I don't know. I'll find another time to jump on and keep working on this ship. I've got the silver interiors to do and the gun turrets. And, you know, the um, there's a little bit of blue for the engines and the energy barriers. This, is, this ship has things like that. And I'll think of some other crazy topic to dive into to talk more about. I do have a, I do have a really cool, awesome, big Legends of Caladagi announcement coming here very shortly because I just sent something off to the printers. <laughs> and I'm working on the theatrical trailer of it right now. I'm probably going to do some voice acting for that later. But for now, we'll see what happens. But next time I jump on, it'll probably be a few weeks before I can formally announce that, but something really cool is coming. You can always head over and join the mailing list at kaladagia.com or, or Facebook, or at some point here, in the next few weeks, I'm gonna set up some other social media things because that's apparently the right thing, the cool thing to do these days. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Do I have the, okay, I don't have a complete Osco. Oh, I do have a complete Osco sitting over there. I'll, I'll go grab it so you can, as I finish up here, I can show you um, what's left to do on it. I'll be back in one quick second. It's right on my kitchen table here. Oh, this was an Arbors of Justice ship too. I apparently like the Arbors of Justice. <laughs> the Arbors of Justice, actually, the white stripes they have end up becoming this kind of coffee color, but I'll get to that later. So you can see the final Oscoda is going to end up having these interior things be all silver. 
The sides, which are a nightmare to paint, I'm not gonna lie, are all silver. I clean up, I think I clean up a little bit better on this miniature than this one. You really, with this, with this Oscoda, you really gotta um, take some sandpaper to these um, side pieces here and just smooth them out really good. Otherwise, they're kind of a nightmare to paint. I honestly probably will never design a miniature like that again. Free design tip like that. It's difficult to cast. It's lots of great tiny little places for the uh, mold to get stuck and rip. And then the molds don't always align perfectly top to bottom because that's just what happens. Um, that, but, you know, you work around it. But you, if you do clean them up with some sandpaper before you paint them, they can turn out pretty good. And then I've got, of course, engines there, energy barriers. So there's some silver and blue to work on this. And I may, on this guy, I may end up kind of grunting this up a little bit with this, uh, you know, the oil, the nun oil stuff that I can't pronounce. But that's about it for now. I think I'm gonna call this streaming session done. You can find more, except more information on Caladagia.com. I'm Jason, the creator of the Caladagia universe. And check out there for some pretty cool announcements. I've shown the Delphinus off a few times. Why not show it off one more time? There's the Delphinus. Oh, there's the Delphinus with his escorting fighters. Those are the more recent miniatures I've released. The Delphinus is for the Surakari faction. And those are the little escorting fighters that tag along with them. And do I have, I recorded, I, I never released a video. I did a live stream painting of the Surakari Interceptors, but I never actually released that over on YouTube. I probably should do that. And of course, there's the Irigul Hammerhead. That's, oh, that's a crappy picture of it. <laughs> I shouldn't have shown that one off. <laughs> that was the one last time I was showing you how not to use. Um, that's a good example. That's actually, once again, a good example of how not to use the a Games Workshop shade. That's why it's so patchwork like that. I went really overboard in using that shade. I was talking about how the, if you go too much of that nun oil, it looks like crap. That's what I mean. I went a little bit overboard with that one. I have a, a much better painted one that's kind of became the um, product image. But, you know, regardless. Anyway, with that... I think I'm just about done. I will jump on sometime in the future. You can follow me over here on twitch.tv. Hit the little subscribe button. You get notifications about when I show up. I guess if you hit subscribe and then turn notifications on. It's a two-step process apparently on Twitch. So subscribe and turn notifications on if you want to see when I'm jumping on. I unfortunately don't have a streaming schedule set up just quite yet. I think come 2017 I probably will get back into one. I had one over the summer where I was building the Aragul Empire Special Forces costume which I don't have a picture of here, unfortunately. That's unfortunate. Should I bring one in? Oh, that's all right. I did a bunch of cosplay work. It's a, a for the upcoming live action trailer of the said product that I was kind of hyping up a minute ago. So not too long, you'll get to see it in action. And I think maybe sometime I'll return to that because I'm gonna want to rebuild the costume in a different way in order to ideally make a couple of them for a short film, but that's kind of far off thinking, blah, 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 kind of a thing. So once again, thank you for watching and have a good night.